It is a fundamental principle of the American legal system and a literary cliché that people are presumed innocent until proven guilty, but it was easy to assume the worst of fertilizer salesman Scott Peterson after his wife Lacey and their unborn son Connor mysteriously vanished in late 2002. After all, this was the man who told his mistress that his pregnant wife had already died, gave contradictory statements about what he was doing the day she was reported missing, was seen laughing at Lacey's candlelight vigil, and sold her car weeks before her body was found. In November 2004, a jury found Peterson guilty of the double homicide, confirming the public's suspicions regarding his strange and unempathetic behavior. In today's video, we are going to have a look at a timeline of events in this tragic case and give our bad things view on what most likely happened and why. December 24th, 2002. Lacey is reported missing. Peterson tells police that he last saw Lacey, who was nearly eight months pregnant, at their Modesto, California residence about 9.30 a.m. that morning before leaving to go fishing, prompting a mammoth search involving local, state, and federal authorities, as well as volunteer searchers. Peterson soon attracts the attention of investigators, who note his lack of concern over his wife's disappearance and his contradictory stories of events of the day she went missing. January 24, 2003 Amber Frey discloses her relationship with Peterson, Amber Frey had been quoted as saying to the media that she began dating Scott for two months without being aware that he was already married. She contacted the police on December 30th after realizing that her boyfriend was connected to the missing woman from the news. March 5th, 2003. Lacey's case is reclassified as a homicide. Authorities do not explain the transition from a missing person inquiry to a violent crime investigation, other than a statement saying that they had increasingly come to believe that Lacey is the victim of a violent crime. April 13th and 14th, 2003. The remains of a woman and fetus are found. A day after the body of a fetus is discovered on the coastline of the San Francisco Bay, the decomposing corpse of a woman is discovered nearby, approximately two to three miles north of the Berkeley Marina, where Peterson claimed to have gone fishing on Christmas Eve of the previous year. April 18, 2003 Peterson is arrested, and the bodies are identified as Lacey and Connor. Scott is apprehended in La Jolla, California, near his mother's home in San Diego and the Mexican border. He is driving a vehicle that contains approximately $15,000 in cash, his brother's identification card, and multiple mobile phones. He had also tried to change his appearance by dyeing his hair blonde and growing a goatee. April 21, 2003. Peterson pleads not guilty. Peterson pleads not guilty to two counts of capital murder during a brief arraignment at Stanislaus County Superior Court. November 18, 2003 Peterson is ordered to stand trial. After 11 days of testimony from investigators, family members and neighbors in a preliminary hearing, Judge Aldo Giralami concludes that prosecutors have shown probable cause and ordered that Peterson stand trial for double homicide. January 20th, 2004. The trial is moved to San Mateo County. Judge Girolami declares that the trial will be relocated 90 miles away to San Mateo County, since Peterson's hometown was no longer a viable venue for a fair trial, due to the immense publicity the trial was generating. June 1st, 2004. Peterson's trial begins. The trial begins with the prosecution's opening statement, which asserts that Peterson wanted a life free of responsibility by murdering his wife and unborn son and discarding her corpse in the bay. August 10, 2004 Frey delivers her crucial testimony. Frey, on the first day of her seven-day testimony, recalls the details of her fairy tale first date with Peterson. Her accounts are reinforced by 12 hours of recorded phone interactions that were played to the jury. November 3, 2004. Jury deliberations begin. 
Peterson's fate is left to the jury after five months and more than 180 witnesses have testified. November 12, 2004. Peterson is found guilty. Peterson is judged guilty of first-degree murder for the death of Lacey and second-degree murder for the death of Connor, despite the absence of a murder weapon or any tangible evidence linking him to the murders. The announcement elicits audible murmurs in the courtroom and a jubilant cry from the crowd assembled outside. December 13, 2004. The jury recommends a death sentence. After 11 hours of deliberation, the court registrar announces that the jury of six men and six women voted unanimously to fix the penalty at death. March 16, 2005. The judge sentences Peterson to death. Judge DeLucci sentences Scott to death by lethal injection. Peterson remains stoic throughout the sentencing, declines to make a statement before being transported to San Quentin State Prison. July 5, 2012, Peterson files an appeal. In a 423-page document submitted to the California Supreme Court, Peterson's attorney resurrects the argument that his client's chances of receiving a fair trial were diminished due to extensive publicity. In addition, he asserts that Judge DeLucci erred by excluding prospective jurors who opposed the death penalty but said they would consider imposing it, and that certain evidence such as the findings of a police dog with a poor track record should never have been admitted as evidence. November 24, 2015. Peterson files a second appeal. The habeas corpus petition covers many of the same grounds as Scott's previous appeal, with one major exception. It reveals that Jura Nice, one of the late trial replacements, lied about an earlier involvement in legal proceedings by failing to disclose that she had been threatened by her boyfriend's ex-girlfriend while pregnant. August 24, 2020. Peterson's death sentence is overturned. The California Supreme Court overturns Scott's death sentence after agreeing with his argument that prospective jurors were improperly disqualified for their opposition to the death penalty, but a willingness to adhere to it. However, the court rejects his claim that he was denied a fair trial and upholds his conviction of homicide. October 14, 2020. Peterson's convictions are ordered re-examined. Focusing on the prejudicial misconduct of Nice's failure to disclose her prior legal issues, the California Supreme Court announces that the case will be returned to the San Mateo County Superior Court to determine if a new trial is necessary. October 23, 2020 Prosecutors announce plans to pursue the same course of action. Assistant District Attorney Dave Harris, according to a spokesman for Stanislaus County, intends to pursue the death penalty for Peterson again. Pat Harris, the counsel for Peterson, tells reporters, an innocent man's been sitting in jail for 15 years. It's time to get him out. November 6, 2020. Peterson declines a speedy trial. Scott waives his right to an expeditious trial in the penalty phase of his case during a Zoom hearing in San Mateo Superior Court, paving the way for a new chapter in his protracted legal saga. December 8, 2021. Peterson is resentenced. Scott was resentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole by a California judge. Scott Peterson has never admitted to murdering his pregnant wife and unborn child. He and his family have always maintained innocence. In addition to repeatedly cheating on his young wife, Peterson displayed a peculiar demeanor during his trials. Those who observed Peterson's trials reported that he often appeared emotionless and even sociopathic. Peterson blamed the court for labeling him a terrible person due to his affairs and contends that because he was a cheater does not make him a murderer. What most likely happened to Lacey Peterson, and why would Scott Peterson commit this heinous crime? Our What Most Likely Happened is a straightforward case of uxoricide, or the killing of one's wife. 
Peterson murdered his pregnant wife, Lacey Rosha Peterson, on the evening of December 23, 2002, or the morning of December 24, 2002, using a non-bloody method such as suffocation or strangulation. Then he transported her 90 miles away from their home to the Berkeley Marina and discarded her body from his unregistered cash purchased and secret fishing boat. Peterson tried to cover his tracks, but in all honesty, his attempts could have filled a whole season of America's dumbest criminals. Five months after Lacey went missing, her torso and that of her son washed up on the shores of the San Francisco Bay, only one to two miles from where Scott said he had been fishing on that fateful day. Her head, hands, limbs and feet were missing. According to the prosecution, Lacey's corpse was weighed down by concrete anchors made by Peterson, causing only her torso to pull free from the anchors and surface. The circumstantial evidence clearly points to Peterson's guilt. In 1994, while working as a waiter in college, Scott met Lacey Rosher. The couple moved in together in 1996. In 1997, Lacey earned a degree in ornamental horticulture and the couple wed. Later, Scott returned to school and earned his degree in 1998. During this period, Scott had several extramarital affairs, one of which Lacey was aware of. In 2000, with plans to start a family, the Petersons bought a property in a pleasant neighborhood in Modesto. Scott started selling fertilizer, while Lacey began working as a substitute teacher. Following 18 to 24 months of fertility problems, the couple conceived their first child, a boy who was due on February 10, 2003. On December 24, only six weeks before Connor's delivery date, Lacey disappeared. According to judicial documents, money was limited in the household at the time of Lacey's disappearance. Scott and Lacey both liberally spent their limited disposable income and had less than $2,000 in savings. However, this fact was not widely known among acquaintances and family, neither was Peterson's repeated adultery. Many people believe that Scott's affair with Amber Frey was his only one while he was married to Lacey. This is a misconception. Peterson engaged in at least four affairs while married to Lacey. Peterson was an accomplished liar, and this would become clear during the investigation into Lacey's disappearance. When Peterson's strange behavior and observations by investigators are put together, the case against Peterson seemed clear-cut. The following are just a small percentage of the inconsistencies in Peterson's account of the disappearance and circumstantial evidence found by investigators. According to Peterson, Lacey was supposed to be walking the dog when he last saw her, but according to her obstetrician, yoga instructor and neighbors, she had not been walking due to her advanced pregnancy. After Peterson's iconic, hey beautiful call at 2.15 p.m., he never called Lacey's cell phone again, even though he knew she was missing. Peterson returned home to find the house empty, Lacey's car in the driveway and a dog on the leash in the backyard. Instead of trying to contact his wife, Peterson emptied dirty mop and bucket water and placed the mops outside, took off all of his clothing and washed them. He made himself something to eat. He showered. Only then did he call Lacey's mother and questioned the neighbors. Even after this, it was Lacey's stepfather who called the police, not Peterson. When patrol officers arrived at the residence, they observed several peculiar characteristics. The scene was so peculiar that the officers contacted their sergeant, who concurred that homicide detectives should be contacted. Outside the door, the detectives discovered two mops and a moist bucket. Additionally, the floor appeared to have been recently mopped. The sidewalk was also damp. On the kitchen counter, there was an open phone book with a full-page advertisement for a criminal defense lawyer. They noticed a rug near the back door that appeared to have had something heavy dragged over it. As soon as he saw it, Peterson straightened it out. When questioned about his morning, Peterson responded, I was fishing, and gave Detective Spurlock his parking receipt, despite not being asked for it. He then engaged in this conversation with Spurlock, an avid angler. Spurlock, what did you go fishing for? Peterson, no answer. 
Spurlock, what did you use for bait? Peterson, first a pause. Some type of silver lure. Spurlock, where do you keep your fishing stuff? Peterson, I keep it at my company's storage facility. Peterson later approached Spurlock and said, Sturgeon. Once homicide detective Al Bracini arrived at the scene, he noticed several other odd things in the house. Bracini observed a five-foot-long impression on the bed that he found peculiar because it resembled the shape of a corpse. Peterson told investigators that they could investigate his warehouse, but it would be difficult due to the lack of electricity. A later search warrant found that to be false, as the warehouse had electricity, including fluorescent lighting overhead. Concrete debris was discovered in Peterson's boat and truck bed. The prosecution asserts that this debris was from the concrete anchors Peterson made to weigh Lacey's body down in the San Francisco Bay. A minor laceration was seen on Peterson's knuckle. Despite having limited funds, Peterson paid cash for a boat on December the 9th. Peterson did not register the vessel, and neither Peterson's family nor his acquaintances knew about the boat. The boat was first used on the 24th of December. Peterson did not decide to go fishing that morning. He purchased a two-day fishing license for December 23rd to 24th. Peterson did not open the fishing laws he had bought. They were found in his vehicle unopened. Peterson went fishing 90 miles from his home, despite having plans and errands to run that evening. Peterson could have fished in nine other locations, but he chose Berkeley Marina, where he fished for less than an hour before leaving. During his interview, Peterson denied that he and Lacey had marital problems and stated that neither of them had ever had an affair. During his first interview, Scott exclusively used the past tense when referring to Lacey. Peterson asked Bruschini for contact information for bereavement counselors, even though Lacey had been missing for only a few hours. Neighbor Karen Service spoke with Peterson on the evening of the 24th when he was searching for Lacey. Peterson informed her that he had spent the day golfing, not fishing. Peterson contacted Detective Braschini to inquire about the status of the search for Lacey. Peterson inquired, Have you used cadaver dogs yet? Braschini replied, Cadaver dogs are used for sniffing out dead bodies. Have you given up hope on finding Lacey alive? Peterson did not reply. Lacey had been missing for less than 24 hours at this point. This was the only occasion Scott contacted law enforcement regarding his missing wife. With all of these inconsistencies, search warrants were executed on Scott's residence, place of business, and both vehicles. The shoes Peterson claimed Lacey wore while walking were discovered in the residence. A comforter was taken into evidence because it had two droplets of blood near the foot of the bed. It was later found that the blood was Peterson's. A pair of corroded pliers with black hair adhered to them were discovered on Peterson's boat. Later analysis revealed that the hair was identical to Lacey's. A cadaver dog detected Lacey's scent on the boat and boat trailer in the warehouse. Debris from dry concrete and a water container with concrete detritus on the bottom were discovered in Peterson's warehouse. Four circular imprints formed by concrete residue were found on the ground in the warehouse and the boat trailer. The rings were the exact same size as the concrete boat anchor Scott had created. Peterson's personal and work computers were confiscated after it was discovered that he had been researching tidal activity in the vicinity of the Berkeley Marina as early as December 8th. For weeks, Scott did not cooperate with the Modesto Police Department's request to get Lacey's dental records. He made excuses such as not knowing the address or forgetting which dentist she saw. The records obtained by the authorities revealed that Scott and Lacey visited the same dentist. Many true crime enthusiasts and mental health professionals have tried to figure out why Peterson committed this nonsensical crime. Aphrodite Jones, a woman who eats, sleeps, and breathes true crime, has her opinion on the motive. Scott and Lacey Peterson were the seemingly perfect all-American couple. Yet, according to the true crime author, reporter, and television producer, 
Peterson had too much of it all, particularly when he discovered he would become a father. Most people have said that Scott just wanted to get away from the marriage, but the murder of Lacey Peterson was all about the unborn baby, Jones said. Jones stated that, in her opinion, Peterson is, was, and always will be a prototypical sociopath. In the eyes of his parents, he was the golden boy of his family and could do no wrong. Peterson had been adored and praised since birth, but with a new infant on the way, he would no longer be the center of attention, at least not in the way he had become accustomed to. The excess of attention combined with Scott's narcissistic and sociopathic traits created a ticking time bomb that detonated when he realized he would no longer be the top priority after the birth of his son, Connor. It wasn't Amber Frey, Jones continued. He only knew her two and a half weeks. He was a serial cheater and had been caught before. No, this was about baby Connor. Scott played the role so well that he had everyone around him fooled, even Lacey. He couldn't handle the attention being taken away from him. This wasn't about Lacey. It was about getting rid of the baby. Do you agree with this opinion? Or do you think Peterson killed Lacey so that he could carry on with his playboy single life? Leave us a comment below. We would love to hear from you. If you love our content and want to support the channel, feel free to check our web shop where you can find exclusive true crime merch brought to you by Bad Things.